What's up, volleyball fans? I'm Darren Tipton, and welcome to the VB Adrenaline Podcast. Our podcast, we will dive deep into the heart of the game, bringing you the hottest topics, prospects, and a buzz surrounding prep and college volleyball, especially the world of recruiting. In each episode, our crew will spotlight rising stars who are shaking up the national game. Plus, we will serve you the scoop on current events that have coaches and fans talking courtside. Tune in for the episodes that spotlight tomorrow's college stars, new trends in the sport, plus interviews that will keep you informed on the explosion that is volleyball in the USA. You can connect with us on social media, Instagram at vbadrenaline.com underscore and Twitter at vbadrenaline. Be part of the conversation. Share your thoughts on your favorite players, prospects, and predictions by using hashtag VBAdrenaline. So grab a seat, volleyball fans, and get ready to dive into the world of spikes, sets, and serves with the VB Adrenaline Podcast. See you there. All right, hey everybody, it's Darren with VB Adrenaline and another episode of the VB Adrenaline Podcast. Uh, I'm, I'm really starting to enjoy doing these things because... I am getting to meet some of the coolest people in the sport of volleyball, whether it's prospect, coaches, people on the business side, and, and we dive into a little bit of everything here on this podcast. Back for another episode, and I am lucky to be joined by Coach Steve Aird, uh, head coach of Indiana University in the Big Ten, and uh, Hoosier Nation. Coach, thanks for your time today. Appreciate you, Darren. Happy New Year, man. Yeah, yeah, well, and uh, really happy new year for you. Let's just jump right in. Congratulations um, on the big contract extension and big news and I would think a little bit of program stability for you, but tell us about that a little bit. Yeah, well, it starts with uh, having great kids and a great staff. I think that's number one. We've had a couple pretty good seasons back to back and you know, I think I'm really grateful. I'm humble. Um, I know there's a lot of work. I know how tough the conference is. You know, I got to Penn State as a player in 97, 98. So I've been around the Big Ten for a long time and uh, really fortunate to still be in it. I think when I look at the quality of the kids we have and the quality of the staff, the support, um, yeah, my, my family and I are thrilled that we're here and uh, keep going to work. That's what we're doing. So. What what have you seen since you've been around the Big Ten um, so much, other than maybe the media popularity um, that goes along with the sport, but especially the Big Ten? Um, what are some changes you've seen in the Big Ten, in volleyball in the Big Ten, in, say, the last 15 years? So it starts with this. The, the traditional powers have always been really, really good. And there's been really good volleyball across the conference for as long as I can remember. I mean, I remember matches when I was a freshman and sophomore at Rec Hall uh, where Penn State's playing teams, and it was unbelievable. It's a Lindsey Bergs in Minnesota and some of the great Michigan State teams and with Chuck Irby coaching. And so I've, I've been fortunate. Like, I've seen a lot of it. Here's what I think happened in 2005 through 2010 through 2012-ish. Penn State went on that run 2007, 8, 9, and 10. And I was really lucky to be there at the beginning of it and be around some of the best players, you know, that I've ever been in the gym with. But I think around 2009 or 2010, I think the Big Ten in general said, OK, enough of this. Like, we want to win, too. Uh, and what you saw was an incredible increase in resources. There's always been great coaches and players, but the resources that went into it, I think, started the boom. And then uh, there became great parity. You know, I think over the next you know, five, six, seven years, you had programs that have always been great, just kind of go to the next level. Um, the thing that I'm most excited about, and, and I hope I had a small part in, is some of the programs at the bottom of the Big Ten then got real good. And I think if you ask the coaches in the Big Ten now, it's there's no one in the conference that's bad. Everyone is tough. Um, they've all got really good players. They can all recruit. They're all pros. Um, and so that was a little bit surprising this year with the tournament because we didn't get a ton of teams in. But there's not a lot of teams in the country that are excited to play Big Ten teams, especially at their at their home arenas. So I think the level has been has been um, really, really good and now only going to get exponentially better with the addition of some incredible West Coast programs. So I, it's not going to get any easier to win. Uh, certainly a challenge for everyone in the conference. But, you know, if you're going to work as hard as we do, you want to be at this level and you want to compete with these people. So, so uh, look. 
I think that uh, transitions great into what we want to talk about. And, and uh, I, I always say, I don't, I don't know, maybe it's me and maybe it's pulling for the underdog, but I tend to have a lot more respect for somebody doing what you're doing and building rather than, right, um, taking over maybe something that's already in place. But talk about your program and not the struggle. I, you love it, right? And you know the mission. Um, you knew what you signed up for, as I've heard a couple of coaches say um, in the com- in the conference. But talk about building in the Big Ten when you're not one of those traditional powers. Well, I think the first thing is I'm not very smart. I think it would have been a lot easier to do if I would have uh, maybe gone to a place that, that was already firmly established and killing people. Um, that being said, I love the build. I love the business side of it. Uh, I like the opportunity cost of going somewhere and trying to build it and make it my own. I think that was the first thing about when I left Penn State to go to Maryland. You know, Russ is just, he's a legend. I wanted to know if I could do it. I wanted to know if I could do it at this level and recruit at this level and and win at this level. Um, I'll tell you a couple things. I think number one is you've got to have patience if you want to build it and build it right. I don't think it's, I don't think you can microwave it. I think it's baking. I think it takes time. You got to find the right kids and, uh, make sure the right people are in your program. And that takes some time. I think that's the number one thing I would tell people that are looking to build. Um, I would say that you've got to make sure you're trying to take care of the other pillars. I mean, there's a lot that goes into, you know, when I took the job here, I think they were averaging maybe four or 500 people at a home match. And now we're selling out matches. Like there's things I'm really proud of that are ancillary to the, the actual volleyball part of it. Um, Bloomington as a town is really excited about it. Um, uh, you know, we, when we go out, we go out to dinner with the family or the girls go out. There's a lot of people who are really excited. It's it's cool to be in a college town when the program's building and people are behind you and helping you. So I think that's great. And then lastly, I think you got to find an administration that believes in you and believes in what you're building. Because um, so many people out there now, I think some of the great coaching stories are about administrators that stayed patient and trusted the process a little bit and hung in there with coaches that didn't have a ton of success early. So I, I think it's a combination of all of that. But, but Darren, I think it comes back to you're a good coach if you got good players. And so much of it is recruiting and so much of it is having good human beings in your building. And um, I think that's something that we – I'm really fortunate now that we've got great, great kids. Is it, and I don't know. You, uh, you know me by my na- na- naivety sometimes. I don't know if it gets me in trouble or opens doors for me, but – I don't know what I don't know, but I, 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 I look at things as a fan sometimes because I am learning sure. this game and the recruiting. Does it get frustrating because it looks to me, and a couple of them happen to be in your conference, where they're automatically just picking off the top. And, you know, like if you're going by rankings, right, does it seem sometimes like an insurmountable hill that you're like, how are we ever going to get more talent than them? Yes and no. I mean, I think there's models in every sport about finding the right people that care about each other and play hard and end up doing remarkable things. So talent, you know, talent is important. Uh, Chemistry might be more important. And, you know, Russ taught me something that I really believe in. It's will over skill. If you feel like you can do it and you believe you can do it, you can find a way to do it. But you've got to have great people and people who believe in what you're building and the vision and you know, we'll coach kids hard, but we love on them. And, and I think that's an important part of it, too, is I want them to become really good human beings and um, give more than they get. You know, I'm not a huge fan of entitled players and they deserve, especially in this day and age. Like I want kids to get paid and I want kids to make all the NIL money they want and, you know, have the opportunity to go wherever they need to go. But I want kids who want to be here. And, you know, there, there's examples in every single collegiate sport of a group of of people that get together and believe and they work and they end up, you know, the, 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 the collection of parts is, is turns into something that's really formidable. And, you know, it's a different race. We're running a different race than Nebraska. We're running a different race than Wisconsin. It's, you know, I, there, there was a line early in an interview about how, you know, we, we had a once promising season and we lost a few matches. It's like, Hey, we had the second best year in Indiana history. You know, we won 21 matches. Like we're, we're running our race. I'm not, I'm not comparing it to my time at Penn State. I'm not comparing us to Wisconsin or Nebraska. I want to get better every single year. I want to recruit really good kids. Um, 
I think with the collection of talent we have and what we have coming in, we're going to be a, we're going to be a problem, and we're going to keep working. and And if we lose, this is maybe something I want your listeners to take with you, especially in the coaching world. You want to find kids you can lose with. You know, if you lose, it's like let's go grab a meal and let's talk and let's get ready for the next match. But you know, let's not let it fester. If you if you lose at Wisconsin, that's okay. They're really really good. Um, but like you saw this year, we had Nebraska here and we had them on the ropes and. You know, with all the NIL money and all the all the success and all the history, is volleyball is a funny sport. You can you can play. Momentum's a real thing, and belief is a real thing. So, it's coming. Got the, the one thing. What I'm a big tournament. I'm a bracket guy. The only thing I was upset with, I was waiting for some more big time upsets. It just didn't happen. And people are explaining to me. I get with the five sets, and you know, it's like a yep. best of seven NBA series. But I'm waiting for that as the talent levels. You know. Parity, um, you know, parity gets more. I think you've seen that more in college football um, recently. Yeah, there's some powerhouses, but there's also a, a Washington that can uh, knock off a Texas, right? Like where that's coming, I think, with volleyball. And it's not just a given that you're advancing this team automatically, um, whether it be on a, a Sunday afternoon in a Big Ten match or uh, first, second round of a tournament. But um, <clears throat> let's talk about your 2024 class. And I'm assuming, Coach, look, you're a building, you're a development. Yeah, you're going to get portal as needed, but that's that's not the majority makeup of your, your lineup. I believe, if is that accurate? You're, you're a developer, you're going to bring kids in? We like to believe that, yeah. I mean, a great example is Cameron Hayworth, who's – you know, she became an All-American setter this year, but she didn't yeah. set in club. You know, we got her as a freshman. She didn't serve in club. She didn't set in club and showed up. And uh, over the years, has just put in the work. I What I will say is that if you find the right kid who's going to work really hard, we can help steer them. I don't think, you know, I don't think coaches, coaches sometimes take too much credit for the work that the kids do. I think you have a certain knowledge base and you say if you do A, B, and C and you work really, really hard, you can become pretty darn good. Um, and we've done that. I think we've got a lot of kids who have become a lot better. Um, what's exciting now is I think we're getting into the pool of kids that are going to be coming here that are really advanced to begin with, that have done a really good job uh, before they get in the door. And I'm interested to see if I can, you know, if we can affect them to help them go up a level or two and really become more competitive nationally. I think that's the key. But uh, you're right. It's a mix. I still believe in building through the draft. I don't think I want to be in a situation where I got to bring in six or seven kids with the portal every year. Um, I really like the relationship piece of, of, you know, Cam Hayworth I met as a ninth grader, you know, before the rule change. And I've seen that kid grow up and turn into a, an unbelievable young woman and one of the better players in the country. And that to me is really rewarding. Um, I could do a lot of stuff with my life, man. I, I like, if I'm not having fun doing this, if I don't enjoy what yeah. we're doing, I don't want to do it. So I want to be around great kids and, kids that want to tell me, you know, we had kids coming back early January that wanted to be in the gym at eight o'clock at night and grind and train. And like, you have to tell them chill out for a while, maybe let your body rest a bit. So we've got kids now that are out ahead a little bit. We're excited about that, but you know, and, and I've got a great staff. I've had great assistants over my career that want to be in the gym and help kids get better. And I think that's a really important part, Darren. It's the, it's the tribe of people you attract yeah. and who's here. Um, because you can't do it all on your own. I think early in my head coaching career, I tried really hard to be hands on everything because I felt part of it was maturity and part of it is trying to prove that you can do it all. Um, and I get a little bit older and a little bit better and I start understanding you got to delegate more and you got to trust your people. And um, I think we're in a really good space there now. Well, I love that coach. And before we come back, uh, we're going to dive into some of your classes and recruiting, which is kind of what we do and, and uh, what we talk a lot about. And uh, we're excited. So uh, I think if we're excited, you're probably even more excited. But we're going to talk about that. Let us take a break. And, and we want to fill everybody in. It's time for our weekly segment uh, right now. We want to show you our spotlight player profiles for this week and uh, uh, three more uh, young athletes who I want you to follow along. And they made their player profiles. And you can follow their career, um, their recruiting journey, 
all the way through signing day. Um, you check them out at vbadrenaline.com. And so let's take a look at this week's three spotlight player profiles. This week's first spotlight prospect profile is Brooke Harwood, a middle blocker who plays for Arizona Storm Elite, one of the top 16s teams in the entire USA. You can see her physicals there coming in at 75 inches with a block of 116 inches already. The thing I like about Harwood is look at the different camps that she's already attended. Uh, close to home and throughout the country. So she's definitely weighing her options, keeping her options open and getting a feel of exactly what's out there. Um, and definitely looking more than just regionally uh, for her. And she's going to play in some of the biggest uh, club matches throughout the year in that open division. So a lot of eyes are going to be on this middle um, out of Arizona. Next up is Reese Shugart. Uh, Reese is from South Carolina. Take a look at her highlights, her resume, uh, USAV All-American, AAU All-American. She's a club national champion, South Carolina high school state champion. Uh, the measurables are there coming in at six foot one for an outside hitter with a great block touch, 116 inches. Take a look um, at the regional uh, colleges she's already camped at. Uh, definitely a southeast flavor, but some big time, uh, big time schools that she's given a chance to take a look at her. Um, I think Reese flies a little bit under the radar in this class of 2026. Uh, so look for her during this club season to um, get a lot more attention. Uh, especially with those uh, physical stats that Reese has uh, playing for Stars Volleyball out of South Carolina. And our final prospect profile is Hallie Thompson. Um, if you haven't heard of Hallie already, you will uh, in contention for being the number one overall recruit in the class, going to have plenty of options. You take a look. Uh, we can't even fit her entire resume on the page. Uh, the physical there. 122 wins, so 10 feet, two already touched. Look at the camps, along with a couple camps in Texas, the Nebraska Dream Team camp, and she's taking a look at the West Coast. Very decorated career for this Houston Skyline outside hitter. She has the physical stats. She has the career resume. She plays at the highest level in the country, and she has the personality um to go to a big time program and excel. So look for Hallie Thompson to have plenty, plenty of options uh, across the country when it comes to signing day in June. All right, again, everybody, uh, go to vbadrenaline.com if you want to see all of our player profiles. And something, again, that we're really trying to do with that is to let athletes tell their story. Um, you know, maybe it's a 2029 that we get to watch all the way through. Like Coach was just talking about with uh, one of the kids that he recruits. And we can follow them all the way through their camp process um, as we watch their approach, uh, their approach touch go from uh, nine foot eight to ten foot four over the uh, over the years and and official visits. A great way with our player profiles uh, that you can follow the journeys um, of some of these top prospects that are going to be making names in the Big Ten someday. And speaking of that, let's bring back uh, Coach Aird, uh, Indiana Volleyball. One thing I want to talk about with recruiting, I would think you're at an advantage because Bloomington is a college town. IU is the show in Bloomington, and that's got to create a great environment when you get prospects on campus. Yeah, it's a really cool town. I think that the, the easy recruiting pitch is – it's the Big Ten. It's an amazing college town. The geography of it is incredible. It's right in the middle of so many great volleyball areas and volleyball regions. It's an incredible degree. Um, we like to think we're a pretty fun staff and, and we, uh, we compete pretty good. So, yeah, it's about finding the right kind of kid. And the good news now with, with all of the technology and the ability for kids to research 
the degrees in the town and the campus. If if that's what they're looking for, this is a great option. Now, if you're a city kid, or if you want, you know, if you want uh, palm trees, if you want to go, you know, like it's you can find your fit. And I think that's really important is you got to find the right people who want to be at the right place at the right time. And um, we want to recruit great student athletes. We want to go inside out. So obviously we care about Indiana and the states that touch it so that families can get to it and whatnot. But we've also had a lot of success uh, outside of there with people just understanding the value of an IU degree and playing in the Big Ten. So, um, I'm yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful college town with great people. It's safe. Um, they really care about athletics here. And, yeah, it's a basketball school. I think everyone knows it's a basketball school. Uh, but we're trying to chip away a little bit and maybe make it a little bit more of a volleyball school. So, Well, and, and, and I think you're doing that. You talked about attendance. Uh, jump on that because I went on uh, your site, did a lot of reading, and absolutely crushing attendance numbers this past year. And uh, how many sellouts did you guys have? I think we had two or three for the first time, you know, and they've, listen, they've had some really good teams at IU. They've had great coaching. Um, and I'm really proud of what we're doing at IU, but I also think Darren, it's, it speaks to volleyball on the macro. Yeah. You know, I, I don't think we're anything special relative to what's happening with women's volleyball because there's so many programs this year that broke attendance records. And obviously Nebraska led the way with what they did outside at the football game. And like, it's just becoming so much more popular so it, it's kind of like we say in recruiting. There's a lot of schools with fancy stuff. Everyone's got good-looking weight rooms. A lot of teams are on private planes. You know, a lot of teams are selling out matches. I just think it's great for the sport, and um, I don't want to beat my chest too crazy. I think it's come a long way here, and we're excited. But I, I'm more excited about the sport in general. Well, I will tell you, I, I hate to disagree with you, Coach, but I've been on some campuses, and not every volleyball school has a uh, beautiful weight room. Um, so the ones that do, I think facilities in Big Ten, you talked about resources in the Big Ten. Um, and to keep up with the Joneses, if you will, facilities have got to be a bigger a bigger deal than maybe they were 10, 15 years ago, especially in your conference, yes or no? For sure. And we're really lucky here. I mean, we built a $20 million volleyball arena. We've got boosters like Mark Cuban and Jay Wilkinson and people who, you know, they, they care. And they're going to give back and they want us to do well. And um, we're fortunate that everything is kind of in-house. So our players, when they get here, you know, the freshmen live right across the street. Everything is in-house from nutrition to sports psychology to training to academics. Everything that they need, weight room. Uh, rehab, prehab stuff, all, all is in the same spot. And we share our building with wrestling four or five days a year, but 300, 360 days a year, the nets are up and available for us. So it's a, it's a really unique situation uh, that I was very attracted to when I took the job. I just thought it was going to be a, a place where people could be real serious about the game and get good. Let's uh, jump into your 2024 class uh, as you uh, go through. Uh, we're fans of it. Uh, we're actually uh, big fans of your uh, 25s that are here now. I know you can't talk about that, but uh, some big names, and that's a class we probably focus more on. But your 2024s, uh, you know, by uh, one publication, a, a top 10 class. Uh, talk about it and talk about some of those athletes. Well, the interesting thing this year is we, we kind of return most everyone who played. So we got a little thin in the middle. Uh, we solved a little bit of that in the transfer portal. We brought in a young lady from Missouri who yep. we're really excited about, Maddie Sell. Um, we had another commitment that will be public later that we feel really good about. We think the team it will help the team a lot uh, going into the fall. Um, and then we have four freshmen that are coming in that, that fill a variety, variety of roles that, you know, in a lot of ways, I think they'll battle for some positions early. But it's not an immediate we need you to come in and absolutely go. And I mean, we have some really, really good talented players. Reese, Reese Hazleton was a Gatorade player of the year from Pennsylvania. Yep. Ella Borsma is playing for Loy Ball out of, out of Pineapple. So I think one of the better middles um, physically, uh, she's got stuff to learn, but she's really impressive. So we got some kids that'll make an impact, um, but we just, we're going to be veteran. We return a lot of kids. And I think 24 is that year where, Across the country, because of the COVID stuff and grad years, it'll be a very old year, very mature year. A lot of people playing in their fifth year. And then in 25, I think it gets young. Um, and, and you're right, I can't talk about it, but the 25 class is, yeah. 
outside of the number one class at Penn State I was lucky to be a part of. This might be the best class I've ever recruited, and I'm pretty excited about it. Right. And we luckily, we can talk about it. So if people follow our stuff, they'll see uh, how big we are on it. And uh, we got to see uh, some of those, uh, those gals, uh, even the last couple of weeks, who continue to impress and, and opened our eyes. And, and uh, we started doing this, you know, fully last club season. Uh, I was guilty, right? Who was I looking at? the big names, the traditional powerhouses, yeah. and when what you all were doing jumped out um, ranking-wise, but also getting to see some of those kids at Nationals were like, yeah, something's going on at Indiana that is definitely positive, and, and uh, it's been cool doing a little bit more research where you guys are on a roll. Just is it program success? Is it facilities? Is it finally your guys' hard work just paying off a little more, um, more resources? What do you think has been the difference the last couple of years with these back-to-back, very solid classes? I think it's a testament to the team that we have, the quality of the human beings that we have, how hard they work. It's the kids in-house. I think it's the staff. Um, I think Rachel Morris and Brett Agney, Kevin Hodge, unbelievable people that care. Um, they care about me. I trust them. They're doing really, really good work and they're just incredible people to be around. You know, I think, I think that's important when kids are going through the recruiting process. I think having a, having a vibe with who you're going to play for and who you're going to be around is so important. Uh, you know, because what we do is really hard. This is not easy. Um, trying to compete at this level is very, very hard. It takes an incredible amount of work, a lot of dedication and discipline, You've got to be very unselfish. You've got to be a great teammate. There's a lot of things that go into winning. And you can be really, really good in this conference and still not win. And that's just part of the deal. So um, I think the credit goes to the school, the administration, the team, the staff for how hard they work. And I'm, I'm, I'm lucky, man. I just like part of my job is to try to assemble the pieces, but the pieces are what make it go. And that's what I'm, uh, that's what I'm so proud of is being around these people every day and knowing just how great they are as people. Uh, we talked, especially with this uh, this class of 23s and uh, this talented class of 23s, we talk with a lot of prospects, and I always try and ask them what I call, I, I call the big five, education, distance from home. Um, I want to go to a program that will play for a national title every year. I want to be the difference maker or immediate playing time. Um, a little bit of a mirage with what some of the very, very talented freshmen did this year at the NCAA level? Or do you think that's just girls playing uh, more competitive, more time, better volleyball when they're younger and they're ready to step in more and more or somewhere in the middle? Yeah, I, all of the above. There's really good club and high school coaches in the country. I think that keeps getting better. I think kids are playing at a really high level early. Some of the kids who are getting some international experience and, and playing in big club matches. One of the keys, I think, for a kid's early success in college is how many meaningful matches do they play in during their high school careers, their college careers. So if, they're play, if the night before, Darren, you're going to bed and you got the butterflies and you're like, man, I got to play for a state title tomorrow or I've got to, you know, we've got to qualify tomorrow or it's a, you know, an AAU national, ch whatever that might be, yeah. which... You're learning to be a pro. The more you go through that, the more comfortable you are. And when you look, you know, on the coaching side of it, you know, when you coach against John Cook or Hugh McCutcheon or Russ Rose or whatever it might be, when you're yeah. in front of 10,000 people or 12,000 people, it's ESPN and it's a big deal. You know, early that's dawning and then you get more comfortable in the space and then you realize it's just what you do. It's your gig and you don't really think about any of it. I think it's the same with the players. And the more experience they have that gets them ready, the more comfortable they're going to be at that level. So I think a lot of those kids come in, uh, plug and play, and they're ready to go. And a lot of that stuff doesn't bother them. And I think with kids who don't have that experience coming through, it takes a little bit more time. So um, a lot of the top kids who go to the top programs, the traditional powers, have played in meaningful matches. And, you know, they might get young at certain times in the year, but they're usually pretty ready to go. But if you're talking about you guys having a veteran roster coming back, how how do you talk to a 16-year-old during the process and say, like, listen, it's not – or it's okay 
to take a year or two to develop, right? Like not expecting that immediate playing time and being disappointed if you don't get it, right? Like how do you pitch that? that that doesn't make you a bad player if you aren't all American as a freshman in the big 10. Yeah. I think you tell them the truth. I, I think you just say, Hey, listen, this is, I think you're a great prospect. We've got a great plan for you. We have a really good plan to develop you over time. Here's kind of the schedule. Here's how it's going to work. Um, but you know, I, the, when you play the prettiest girl in the room thing that you're the best player and you're going to play all the time, you know, the one thing I'm pretty straight with kids is, you know, I coach Megan Hodge and Krista Harmato and, you know, some of the best, like, some of the best players ever I was lucky enough to be in the gym with. Like, it, we have good players here, but our job is to have them become the best version of them. You know, I don't want to compare them to the Lauren Carlinis or I don't want to compare them to the, you know, the best players in the country. It's, listen, here's your plan for you. Here's what we, we believe is going to be the best thing for you. Um, and I do think that's one thing with the portal, Darren, that's the days of like struggling through a freshman year and then being good as a sophomore and then all conference as a junior and all American as a senior, like those days don't really exist anymore because if a kid doesn't get everything immediately, um, they're moving on fast. And I think that's, that's tough. I mean, I'm obviously not a fan of it. I understand it's what's happening. I get it. Um, but a little bit of adversity in your life makes you a better human being. And, you know, if I was to go through my own story, I mean, I was, I was a pretty good player. I got recruited, you know, I started, uh, I started with the national team stuff. I got benched. I got cut. I played at Penn state. I started, I was great. I played left. I was libero. I got beat out like every single imaginable iteration of what you go through during your career. I went through, um, you know, I tore my ACL as a, as a high school junior, I shattered my arm playing basketball in 10th grade. Like there, you go through tough things. And then on the other side of it, you kind of be, you become who you are because you go through tough things. So I think that's something that's not as prevalent anymore. And I think it's tough because once you get into the real world and it's your first time you've got a job and it's you in the apartment and you close the door, like you've got to have some skills to be a pro. And when we send kids to go play <coughs> professionally, we want them to be a pro. We want them to understand how to take care of their business and be confident and um, be ready to tackle life. And I think that's something that, I hope is still really prevalent in the college game that we're trying to develop human beings and make them help them be ready for the next stage in their life, whatever that might be. And, and so I, I guess neither of us need to get on a soapbox here, but one of the discussions, what I guess what I'm getting at by asking that I, I have issues with the timeline. I, I, I don't see how a kid can commit when they haven't been on an official, like how you can really get a feel for where you're going to spend the next four years. Hopefully there's steps for that improving um, sooner rather than later. But what I'm wondering is in the recruiting, our coaches, if you're doing a great job and being honest, like you said, like, hey, we have a plan for you. It may take a year to develop, right? That, that doesn't mean we think less of you. Does that help cut down on those portal numbers as opposed to the coach who might say, yeah, you're going to compete from day one. Everybody competes for immediate playing time. They don't get it. And then they're like, hey, I was lied to. Or, you know, you know those recruiting yeah. tricks. And then they're in the portal because they feel jaded. You know what I'm saying? So the upfront, honestly, like, hey, we have a development plan for you. Do you think that would help decrease some of the numbers? Or is it just that instant gratification? I don't get it. That's the way kids are today. You know, I, I don't think it's all that. I think kids today are like, I think with the right kids in the right family, they totally understand exactly what you said. Yeah. And they understand what the process is. I also think when you, when you decide to go to a place, it's because you know where, where they're at and what they're expecting and what it is. You know, there were kids at Penn State who never got into a match when I was there, but they loved their experience. They didn't care if they had to wipe the floor. They were just all about the program. And that was one thing. I think that there's other places where kids want to play all the time and sometimes they'll get beat out by a kid who's just flat out better and that's just life. And if they want to find a different opportunity, I think no, more power to them. I think that's great. I think what it comes back to for me is I want people who want to be here. That's number one. You know, you want to coach kids who want to be at IU. You want to coach kids that want to be part of the build. Um, they want to work really hard. Um, you know, and it's like anything else. If you talk to any good coach, they'll say, you know, make me play you. 
you know, like people, sometimes parents and players don't understand. Like I, I, I love my program. I love the kids in my program. I really love my staff. I love my wife. I love my babies and my job is to win matches. So there's no, like there's, there's kids that, you know, every coach will say, these kids I really like for certain reasons. At the end of the day, we're trying to win. And all we're trying to do is develop everyone so they can help. And whatever their tool is, whatever their role is, is going to help pull the rope. And, and you, end up, you end up winning more than less if you can get people to buy in. You know, if, if kids care about each other and they play hard, you've got a chance. And if the team is selfish, if the team is uh, divisive, if there's kids on the team who are trying to tear it apart, you can't win. You know, and, and often your best player has got to be your best people. So your leadership and the kids in the locker room, because even in the spring, Darren, we get a couple hours a week with them and that's it yeah. until we get to March. Like you, you need the locker room to care a great deal about what they're doing and you've got to have great leadership or else there's no chance you're winning. So that takes time when you're building uh, to develop and groom and find those kind of people. So. <clears throat> a couple things and then uh, we'll let you go coach. And I really appreciate the learning uh, from you and more about your program, but Talk about the life of a college coach now. Everybody's coming back. Um, do you guys start hitting tournaments uh, right away on the recruiting trail? Do you kind of wait for qualifier season more? What What does your schedule look like now through, say, uh, the end of qualifiers? Well, to be blunt, like I got a couple days with my family over Christmas. I got to take my wife to Vegas. We love Las Vegas. It's, she's a chef, so... We like to go there and hang out and actually like I like to date my wife, <laughs> like actually spend yeah. some time with her because during the season I can't. Um, but we worked her right the way through. It was portal. It was yeah. planning the recruiting calendar. It's camps and clinics. It's planning the spring training. It's individual meetings with players. It's team meetings. Um, I tried my staff got a really nice break because they just worked so hard. They needed time. But I was in Bloomington a lot thinking about the next stuff. Yeah. Um, we will we'll meet with the girls. Uh, they went back to school relatively early. We'll do individual meetings and map out the spring and the summer. Uh, we'll have a team meeting in a few weeks where I kind of give the State of the Union, this is where we're at, this is what we're doing, this is how it's going to work. And then we're allowed to be on the road starting the 16th of February. That's the Triple Crown Tournament. And we will we will be there and we will gun it from there through uh, May 1 when we're not allowed to. Uh, I'll go back to Vegas. <laughs> I'll, I'll do me for a while. <laughs> And then starting in June, we'll gun it June and July. And uh, that's, that's what this is, man. It's a 365-day-a-year it's a a year pursuit. And for two reasons. Number one, we want to chase great together. I think that's really important. But I want to do everything in my power to give these guys the best experience. You know, Like I was lucky to play in Final Fours. I've won two national championships. I've coached in big matches. Um, I want every single one of these kids at IU to feel what that feels like. And, and that's, I'm relentless about that. I, I care about them that much that I'm going to go as hard as I can so that I hope they feel what it's like to be selected on Selection Sunday and get the chance to make the tournament and make a run at it. And um, that's what I owe the school, and that's what I owe these kids. I appreciate it, Coach. And we also will be at Triple Crown. Where, uh, we are pumped to be doing our daily show for the second year. Uh, that's kind of why that's where we launched everything last year. And that is um, that's when it all uh, ramps up again, 110 miles an hour for uh, for everybody. Definitely a very talented weekend of volleyball. Um, and so we'll see you there. Um, I know you'll have a million things to do in the meantime, but. As we leave, we ask everybody this, uh, athletes and coaches, for the 26s, yep. number one piece of recruiting advice you could give to pre- – so they are the most prepared that they can be for their June 15th. I think it's uh, – I think technology is great. So you can, you can learn about the program, learn about the people. I think that's an important piece of it. I think trying to get on campus, whether it's camps or when stuff goes live after you're allowed to do that is pretty important. Um, you know, it's very rare in this day and age where a kid will commit before you've ever met them. I know that happens. I get it. Um, but, you know, to, to a lot of programs, uh, I will say this. There's a lot of kids who start going to stuff in seventh, eighth, ninth grade. They go to a bunch of camps. They meet the team. They meet the staff. They're around them. And they've always said, hey, this is the place I want to be. And it works out. That's fantastic. I think for other kids, I think it's a pretty important decision. And I think you got to do your research and stay patient. Um, 
dream big. I mean, the worst thing you can hear is no. You know, there's a lot of kids I wish I could recruit because I think they're phenomenal, but it might not be the right fit for the program. You know, if we've got three setters on the roster, we might be not be looking at a setter. It doesn't mean we don't think X setter is unbelievable and a great kid and a great family. So a, a lot of life comes down to timing and uh, you make your own luck, you know, and, and maybe the best thing I could give them all is, is be a great teammate. You know, I think that's an important part of it. Like, like really try to give more than you get because talent wise, listen, it's, if, if talent's easy to spot, but if you're building, if you're like me, you're really trying to find the right kind of kids who want to give more than they get. They're humble and they work hard and they care and they're great with the community and the fans and young players that want to be them. Um, that's so important to me because when you don't have that, it makes it incredibly challenging. And so you want to try to find the right people and, you know, being a great teammate, working hard, um, trying to help people around you. Those are things that are life skills that are going to help you for the next 40 years. And something I think is really important for them to remember. Yeah. Great. Uh, I say this all the time. Great athletes are really cool when great athletes are great human beings. Um, those are my all Americans and, uh, the kids that are easy to pull for no matter where they go. So coach, thank you for your time. I am excited to meet you officially in person. Um, so I will find you and, and say hello for sure. Um, you keep building and everybody again, this is Steve Aaron, head coach at Indiana university, Hoosier nation in the big 10 brand new contact, the contract extension, a couple back to back banner recruiting classes. So make sure if you haven't already, make sure you're following what's going on in Indiana uh, volleyball um, and turning that into a volleyball school. But coach, we thank you for your time, everybody. This has been another edition of VB adrenaline podcast. And if you have comments, you want to weigh in on what we talked about um, anything else, what you want to hear in the future, Follow us uh, Instagram at vbadrenaline.com underscore and on the X at vbadrenaline. And everybody will be back later and excited to learn more and talk more recruiting and volleyball in general. Take care, everybody. Awesome, Coach. Thank you so much. Um, and.